once I like gauged on a price point, I was like, okay, it might not be for everyone, but my tribe will find me, you know? You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Michaela Matthews Okome. So let's get started. This episode is brought to you by Podcast Moguls. All right, guys, I heard you. You're like, Nikayla, when is your next podcast training? How can I join Podcast Moguls? What's going on? All right, guys, getting ready to open up a new cohort. And I am teaching a free training on Thursday, February 18th. So Podcast Moguls is my podcast accelerator program for podcasters who want to take their podcast from hobby to profitable side hustle. My next training, How to Grow Your Brand Through Podcasting, is happening Thursday, February 18th. Register at podcastmoguls.com. It's going down at 8 p.m. Eastern. You'll learn the best way to stand out as a podcaster, the number one thing you can do to grow your downloads, and how to attract press and speaking opportunities. If you're ready to make your podcast your next side hustle, don't forget to join me on Thursday, February 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern so I can teach you all of my strategies. Register again at podcastmoguls.com. Link is in the show notes. All right, see you there. Hey, 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 guys. Welcome, welcome back to the show. We are back this week with more guest interviews. That's right. I really hope you enjoyed the solos to kick off this year with our Side Hustle Pro Bootcamp. And I hope you're all getting started with your side hustle this year. And now let's get back to chatting with our guests. So today in the guest chair, we have Kanishia J. Sams. Kanishia is a nail artist and owner of Nails by Kanishia. Kanishia specializes in hand-painted luxury press-on nails and nail care. She is known for her abstract nail art, unique color palettes, and her passion for nail health. Kanishie immediately caught my attention when I came across her profile on Where Else Instagram. But what really stood out to me is how this amazing nail artist had found a way to pivot and change her business model during a pandemic. After the pandemic forced her nail studio to close, Kanishie found another way to make a living. Today, Kanishie produces luxury press-on nails in a variety of options, including mystery sets. If you don't know your measurements, she even offers a sizing kit for you to determine your custom fit before placing your first order. Genius! She has been featured in numerous magazines, including Glamour and Cosmopolitan. She's collaborated with brands like Sally Hansen and Facebook, and she was even named one of Nail Pro Magazine's 30 Under 30. Let's go ahead and chat with Kanishie. So, first things first, give us a little background on Kanishie. Who are you and what do you do? I am a mother, a wife. I am a nail artist based out of Sacramento. I focus on nail art and nail care. And I recently started doing press-ons for my business. And not just any press-ons, the bomb press-ons, but <laughs> we're going to, the, the <laughs> amazing you. designs that, you know, as soon Thank as you come you. across them, you're like, wait, who is the person behind this? So Thank you so much. Oh, I mean, I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to know how someone goes from studying criminology in college to <laughs> being a nail artist. Walk us through your journey and your career path a little bit oh man it was crazy now that I think back at it like I was in college and I would just paint my nails like all the time like me and my husband we would get out of class and then I would like take me to Sally's (laughs) and (laughs) I would be getting like all types of nail polish all the time and I'd just be painting my nails all the time and then I started practicing and like my sisters and everyone's like you're getting good and I'm like oh okay like this is just something fun I like to do and then my husband was like babe you're really good like you should look into nail school and I'm like nail school like I go to college like I can't go to nail school and so I was like you know he was like just look it up and so I looked it up and they had night classes so I could do this was like at the end of the semester so I could make my new semester. So I decided like, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm just going to go for it. So I signed up for night classes and I was still going to the university during the day. So I did both of them at the same time. 
And that was wild. But it was like the best decision ever. It was mayhem. So what was that like going to nail school? I mean, were you all of a sudden like, I need to change my whole life plan? <laughs> like, seriously, everyone was like questioning me. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yo, I'm just I'm just going where this leads me. It's just really interesting. I was like, you know what? Like, I'm still doing college during the day. And then I'll do nail school at night and we'll just figure it out. Like, I was like, I wanted to be a detective or a counselor. <laughs> and then I'm like, um, dude, I don't know how this is going to work. But I just kept getting like so pulled by like the passion of like nail art and like nails. Like I still was interested in criminology and I finished my degree, but I was like, I really love nails. Like, this is crazy. And my grandma was like, okay, baby, as long as you finish, like, we'll figure it out then. But yeah, go ahead. Everyone thought I was nuts, though. And what happened when you did finish? You know, you're at this fork in the road now. You graduate. Did you move immediately mm -hmm. into nails or did you actually pursue criminology work? You know, it's so funny. So I graduated college in 2016. And um, I had finished nail school a little bit earlier before that. And me and my husband found out we were pregnant. And I was like, yo, like, what does this mean for like everything? So my husband got a job that moved us from our hometown to about 300 miles away. So I like literally could do anything at that point. Like I just had finished college in nail school. And um, at this time, like our son, he was born, he was about six months old. And I was like, yo, if I don't just try to go for it, I'm never going to do it. Like, let me try to find a salon to boof rent at. And then if it doesn't work, I guess I would try to go get a state job. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine, <laughs> if I, if I, you know, knowing what I know now as a parent. <laughs> yes. And it's so crazy because my son was literally so young. Like I was still in college when I had him. It was I had him my last semester of school. So. I literally was interning and still finishing my last semester up. And I was still like doing like my sisters and my friends nails. And I was just like, what am I doing? And my son was so young. And like, I went back to school, like, like after I had him 17 days later. What? So it was like, <laughs> and, yes. And I had a cesarean, but it was just what? like, yo, you started this. Grandma you come in finish. handy? Like what, where did literally, you Literally, my it? grandma, my grandma <laughs> like, literally was like everything. My big mom, she was like, okay, baby, we got this. Like and my husband, like, actually he was like, okay, you got to finish this out. So like he went to work in like part-time and it was just like really me and him and my mother-in-law would come over at nighttime and watch the baby. But literally it was me and him switching out schedules. Like it was madness. Wow. Now I look back and I'm just like, how did I do that? That's what I want to ask you. How did you <laughs> do that? You know, tell us about that first booth inside of a nail salon. Did you immediately take to it? Were you were you happy with that decision? It's so crazy because it wasn't even a nail salon. Um, it was a esthetician like beauty lash lounge. So we had just moved to Sacramento and I was just like, let me, I'll, I already knew with my style of nail art, I liked working alone and I liked being my own boss. And I knew that I wanted my own studio or my own set hours because my son was still so young and I wanted to like make sure that I was following my dream, but I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't miss so much of his baby moments. So I decided to booth rent in a esthetician salon. And that was wild. That was like my first time, like going out and doing anything by myself. Most people will go right into working in a nail salon, but I just knew how I was in like traditional nail salons. They don't look like people like me, to be honest. And the, when I was in nail school, a lot of people, one of the instructors told me, she was like, yo, your nail art, no one's going to pay for that. Nobody wants that. Like the future is French tips. Like that's where you get your money at. The future but, is French tips. <laughs> yes. And I was like, I know that people love this. Like I, I love it. And my clients loved it. My siblings loved it. And I was like, no, I, no, that's not true. So I went straight in booth running and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for everybody. I just had faith. Like this has got to work out. So I started booth renting at a salon and literally like I didn't have no clientele. Mind you, I just moved into a new city. So I booth rented with no clients. How did 
how did you start to pick <laughs> up clients? I mean, let me just clarify that your your style of nail art it is unique. It's vibrant, you know. So for the if you're in a if yeah. you're in a salon where people really are just coming to get like, you know, pink or white standard mm-hmm. nude nails all the time for work, how do you start to build that clientele? It was crazy because of the area I was in is pretty prestigious. Like I didn't know like the map of the new city that we're working in. Like I didn't know, but I was just like, I looked on Craigslist and that was available and it looked like nice. The salon looked nice. And I was like, cool. But when I got in there, I noticed, like you said, these were like working women. And a lot of them like were like, oh, pink, blue. But I was just like, yo. So I announced on my Instagram, like you guys, I'm moving to Sacramento. Like, you know, hit me up, <laughs> hit me up for an appointment. And so like for the salon, I think I got like three clients from them, but like literally it was like me Instagramming. And if I wasn't working, if I didn't actually have a client, I was in there practicing nail art. And like, I remember the first time I got my first client, it was on me and my husband's anniversary and we were broke. Okay. Like we, we were broke. I was like, I'm taking this appointment. So like, I think I made like $50 from my first appointment. I was so proud. And like, we turned around and like bought dinner and gas for our like anniversary. (laughs) And then it took off. It took off. It like slowly started. Like people were like, I could have easily been like, you know what? This clientele wants um, one colors and I could have just like pumped them out. But I just, that just wasn't what I went into it for. Like I knew that I wanted to do my type of nail art. And so like referrals started to come in and like people were like, I seen this on Instagram and my friend says you do her nails and it slowly started to trickle in. Are there any specific steps you took on Instagram or you started to notice like specific types of content or posts that would do better and really help to promote your work and bring in new clients? You know, what's so funny. Like I just I just showed like my nail mail, what I was bringing in. I would show a little bit about my process and I would just like post like nail art samples like constantly, even though I wasn't working on clients and like had basically nothing to post besides my own hands. I was just like, let me just keep on creating, like in this waiting time, continue to create. Like people love to see your steps. They love to see like, oh, what you're bringing in or like your trial and your errors. So I was pretty transparent. And I was just like, you know, um, you guys can book with me. You can get this look. And a lot of clients, I noticed like the styles I would do on my own hands. They were like, oh, I like that. I'm like, okay, let's, let's do that then. You're so right about people loving to see the steps. It, it makes you like root for the person, but also it it, yeah. it, re- it makes you realize that I can do this too in, in, in a way of not necessarily, I'm, I'm not a nail artist, but like I too can start something, you know, like yeah. look at how she's doing it one step at a time, laying one brick at a time. So thank mm-hmm. you for showing that. Speaking of laying one brick at a time, how long were you booth renting before you decided to create your own spot? So it's crazy. I was booth renting at two different salons before I got my nail studio, which is like basically a room that I pay monthly on, but it was like my room. So before that, I literally was like in an open space, like working in basically what you would call like the, like when you come into a salon, they greet you. I forgot what that place, that spot is called, but I was working in like open spaces, like around everyone. And that's not ideally what I wanted, but I knew like, I'm going to have to start somewhere. It can't just be like exactly what I want. And that taught me like a lot of like what I do like and what kind of vibe and energy I wanted for my space. So I think I worked booth renting for about two years before I got a nail studio. And that was amazing. It was like my other studios, I didn't have walls. I finally had a walls and door. And it was amazing. And I created the ambiance I wanted. And it really like my clients would come in there like, oh, I smell the essential oils. And she got the Erica Badu playing. Like they felt comfortable. (laughs) And I'm just like, I wouldn't switch that up. I'm just like, this is my vibe. And I hope that it attracts the people that want to see me. What other steps did you take? You know, now that you have your own studio at this point, did you formalize your business by incorporating it or just, you know, officially make yourself a business? So you go through a process of like state board, you get establishment license, you get a tax, a business tax license, you pay your 
um, yearly fees as a manicurist and, you know, you get your your CPA, like your tax person. So you go through those little steps, you get your insurance for your room. But at the same time, I was in a studio building with other people who were running their businesses. So next to me, I had estheticians that were working in their studios also. So it was like a shared space, but everyone had their own room. Yeah, I've been to a space like that before. And, and by the way, I think that business model is so smart. Super smart. Super smart. By the way, everyone, you have to be licensed. And that's what you yes. should look for when you're going to these new mm-hmm. Very um, important. What was that investment like as, you know, a young mom going into mm-hmm. this? At this point, was this something where it was easy peasy to pay for or did it require serious, serious saving. Like, can you tell us like ballpark, what was that investment like and how did you prepare for it? The investment was steep in a sense of like, like me and my husband were in college. We were broke college students when we decided like, okay, go to nail school, can you ECA? So my husband actually like, <laughs> I don't say, I don't sell everyone to do this because I'm not a person about getting into debt for your passion. But my husband put my nail school, like half of it on his credit card. And I was like, oh, man, like it's official. So we got to do this. And that's real, though. That is real. Thank you for sharing that. We're not giving financial advice on this podcast, everyone. Just disclaimer here. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. All we're doing is sharing what people did. Okay. (laughs) All right. Exactly. So we it was expensive because of the type of um, nail art and the supplies. Like you have to make a major investment in yourself to kind of start out like in nail school. They don't give you any of these things. It's basically like they're teaching you sanitation and like step by step, like how to keep your client safe, basically. But they're not teaching you nail art or any of that stuff. I picked up that along the way. So a lot of it was like investing in the best materials and stuff. So I'm pretty sure like it was in the thousands, like lease up to seven thousands of just like you would get one thing and you get the lap and then you get like the product line and then you got to start getting buffers and files like things that you constantly have to do maybe taking classes um, but a lot of things I learned on my own just through like practicing but a lot of it was like I did not know previously to going into like nails that it could be so expensive like people think it's just polish and it's like oh my god it's five million items So let's talk about those early days of being a business owner. How did you balance the juggle of personal life with being in business for yourself and the ebbs and flows of business? It was hard. I'm not going to lie. Like, it was really hard trying to figure out, like, my space, in my like, my place in this industry at first, you know, um, because it was like I just moved to a new city and I was working at, like, in our new city, we didn't have much family. It was just like my uncle here. So it was just like a lot of just like growing pains, really, to be honest. And like the first two years of me, like booth renting, I wasn't necessarily like super taking care of myself. Like when you're in the salon space, you like go, go, go. And your client, you're like starting out. So you take whatever in a sense, you know, your schedule's like hectic. So I would work like evenings when my husband would get off work because we didn't have child care. So it was just like whenever like he would work during the day and I would work in the evenings at night. So I missed a lot of like Saturday, like Sunday type situations, a lot of dinners because we had opposite schedules. So it was like really hard. And then it got to a point where I was like, I have to establish a set schedule and like boundaries just for mental health purposes and just like sanity. Like, It's hard to separate your business and your personal life when they're very intertwined like that. But it was so necessary. And once I did that, I felt like I began to like really enjoy it a lot more. I feel like when you're starting out, you're just like, okay, I've invested in this. I have booth rent. I have to make income. So you like really, you allow your clients to text you. You allow clients to DM you. And it was just like so many, um, oh, I need this done on this day. Can you get me in? Um, And when you don't have those set rules, in a sense, when you're very flexible, things get blurred. You know what I mean? 
And people, a lot of people don't take the beauty industry serious as like a serious career. So they're like, oh, you know, you're just going to, you're just going to do my nails. But it's like, this is my livelihood and this is my career and this is how I provide for my family. So these are set rules. These are set business hours. These are set times that I'm working. But I had to learn that through going through the process of being like run down. Oh, that is such such a good topic that you bring up. I know that we all struggle with this because let's face it, DMs mm-hmm. are convenient and easy at times, or like that might be how someone comes across your business. So it's like, wait, but you're on Instagram. I exactly. can just send you a message. But then it's also like, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. And it's, it's definitely like, it can like, begin the conversation, but then we have to move it. We have to, we have to move it on yes. over because we got to be able to move it to email. Yep. Be able to, and it was, it's very hard. Cause I'm super friendly and like, I love engaging with people and I love conversation, but then at a certain point it's like, okay, well you're running a business. So let's like, I've had a lot of people find me in DM. And I'm like, okay, you can go head over to my booking site or you can send me an email and we can schedule it out there. That way everything's in one place. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. There's a lot to love about being your own boss, but trying to figure out your financials on your own isn't one of those things. Luckily, there's FreshBooks, the all-in-one accounting solution that's built for business owners like you. FreshBooks takes all the not-so-fun parts of running a business, from building and tracking invoices to organizing expenses to managing online payments and automates and simplifies them, saving you up to 11 hours a week in the process. FreshBooks has your back at tax time, too. With a ton of reports to choose from, you'll know exactly where your business stands and you can easily hand the keys over to your accountant so they can take over when it's time to reconcile everything for the year. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days, no credit card required. Go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle pro and enter side hustle pro in the how did you hear about us section and get more time back to build the business you love. If you own a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is so easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts, you get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. And if you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all of your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. Here's the best part. Because you are a Side Hustle Pro listener, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com slash SHP. Again, that's gusto.com slash SHP. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. Once business began to pick up, what were some of the challenges of that good problem of having demand and juggling that way? It's so funny because when I started to actually like pick up It was wild. Like my clients would book out months in advance and it was insane. Like I couldn't take any new clients. Like my wait list was past like capacity. I couldn't take anyone else. And because like my son is still super young and like I wanted to make sure that I wasn't spending too much time in the salon because I'm like, yo, like I do have a life besides this, you know, but it was wild. And then I was like, thank God, I'm so grateful. This is finally like <laughs> starting to pay off. I can finally like not be in the negative in a sense because it was expensive at first. I remember I would just like make money to pay boot rent and like not pay myself really. And so when it did start to take off, like I like begin to like, my mindset started to shift. Like work smarter, not harder. And so set like business hours and certain times that you're available and maybe like don't have your schedule so available open because I had clients booking months a year out. I couldn't plan anything. So like my friends like, you want to go to brunch? Oh, I'm working already. Like, how do you know you're working in three months? Well, someone booked on that day. 
So I had to start to learn like, okay, maybe just book a month in advance and then I like, take it from there. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is quite the like limitation factor having things booked out so far in advance. Mm-hmm. Now, not everyone makes money when they first start out. What has been your experience with that as far as breaking even versus making a profit or versus being in the red? <laughs> yes. So I would say like the first two years so i've been licensed five years so i would say like the first two years like it was like i wasn't making much anything i was in the negative i like was not taking home a whole bunch and i would say about the third year i started to break even um and profit a little bit and then it start like the fourth year was like amazing i was like wow this is actually my job like (laughs) i'm actually making money like oh my goodness and obviously you want that to be your your goal. You want your business to be profitable. But first it's just labor of love at first. And then you're like, okay, like what are your expenses? What are your monthly takeaways? Like started having to write things down and plan it out because like at first you're just like, oh, this, all this money is mine. No, you have booth rent, you have insurance, you have like supplies you have to buy monthly. So that was quite the lesson learning that. Mm -hmm. So I would say it took me about two and a half years to be profitable. And that's a lot of people are not profitable in the first two, three years. Now, is there anything that you think you could have done to be profitable sooner, knowing what you know now? I think what it is, is what the beauty industry is so different. Like, I wish I had a perfect answer for this, but I don't. I feel like it really was like learning your limit and like learning through trial and error. So like, there's so many things you can buy. And they're like, okay, do you really need that? Are you going to use that? You know how trends are. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm gonna, <laughs> oh, this is really hot right now. So let me buy that. And I'm like, okay, for example, chrome nails. So I invested a whole bunch of money in like chrome powders. And I literally hated doing that. Like I hated doing that. And I'm like, I don't even like doing this service, but my clients are asking for it. It's pretty and literally hated it. It was like, I'm pretty sure I've invested like over $600 in chrome powders. I was buying all different types because I was like, I like to have all the variety. And I'm like, looking back, it's like, wait it out, sis, and see if you really like that. Like, not because everyone else is liking it. Do you want to provide that service? So like hone in on what type of services you actually want to provide and that align with what you want to do. So now I want to touch on the pivot that you made because of COVID. (laughs) I mean, talk about a monkey wrench, right? A curveball. Oh, man. So how did COVID-19 affect your business model? And what did you shift as a result of it? Oh, man, everything shifted. Like, it was like okay, everything's normal. You're taking clients to, you can't work anymore. You can't see people. The government has shut down personal services. And that was a trip. I was like, oh my God, because you're at the point where you're like, okay, I have my schedule. I see my clients. I know what I make monthly based off of, you know, just like numbers. And it went from like, oh no, you can't work. Like California shut down like for months. I think the first shutdown was like three or four months. And I was panicking because I was like, oh my goodness, like I still have studio rent, like my clients, like what am I going to do? So at this time I still had like my nail care line, which is like cuticle oils and like hand care products. So that was like holding it down for a little bit, but that's, that wasn't gonna pay everything. So like I was doing back in 2016, I was doing like nail samples, like basically like showcasing my art because I couldn't see clients I was just like, okay, I still want to make sure that I'm like creating content and I'm still like painting and I'm still showing like my nail art. And people started to ask, they're like, are you selling press-ons? Like, are those press-ons? I was like, no, they're just like nail samples that I keep like for my nail art menu. And they're like, you should sell press-ons. And I was like, "Uh, I don't really want to do that. We're going to like, the government's going to open back up and I can see clients. (laughs) Little little did I know that was not the case. Um. And... I was like, oh man. So like I started to get so many inquiries about it. And I really, really pushed hard against doing it because it was something new. And it was a whole different business plan of what, like I literally learned a whole different business. So 
it was insane. And I still had my studio open and I was still paying rent on it. And it was like a hard decision. Like I had to make a decision. Like you have to close your studio. You have to close your studio because it just, it's not making financial sense. You're still paying rent and you're not, you can't even work in it. And that was really hard because I, that, like I was telling you, this was the first time I had a, like a walls and a roof. Like it was like my little baby. So I was like, you know, this is hard, but I, I think it's necessary. So closed my studio <laughs> and literally was like, okay, what, what's, what's now, you know? And so I sold my first like press on like set and um, something that I would do with my clients when I was seeing clients, I would do um, mystery manicures. So basically you come in and you don't know what you're getting. So like, I would just like vibe, like at that time I had established clientele. So I knew my clients like aesthetic and everything. So they would just like do whatever. So it was like basically wow, a free style. That's fun. Package. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like all the women that were coming to me at my studio were women that are just getting off work. So they come in, they have the heels and their purse, their computer, like, and then it was just like a time to release. So I would be like, okay, girl, I got you. I know what I'm going to do. And they're like, go ahead. I don't want to make any more decisions. <laughs> like you go ahead and do your thing. And so I was like, let me take that business model over to my press-ons, like a mystery set. And it started from there. And it was like, people were like, I really like that concept. When you rolled it out, you just posted on Instagram. Had you determined a number of sets that you were going to sell or were you just gauging the interest? Yeah, I was, at first I was gauging the interest. I was like, I'm going to do a limited amount because I'm thinking still, this is before I shut down my studio. This is probably like three, four months before I shut it down. And I was like, um, I'm still going back. So I'm just going to do this to hold me over, you know? And then uh, shut down my studio. I was like, no, this is full time now. <laughs> this is your thing. And people like loved it. They're like, when are you doing more? Like, where's your website? Like at this time I wasn't, I hadn't did a, a website yet. And I was like, there's a big interest in this. Like it was so different. Cause I'm like used to seeing clients like, face to face like now I'm creating for a client across you know the states and I'm like you know I don't know your aesthetic I don't know your style but you're really interested in what you see here so that was different and then how did that first round go how did you go about deciding on the price was it just like this is what it would cost in the salon or were you also factoring cost to ship and all of that at first I was like, okay, like you got to ship. And like for my press-ons, I was like, I want to make sure when you get your press-on set that you have everything you need to apply the nails. So I wanted to make sure you had your buffer, your file, glue, your nail tabs, your alcohol wipe, like all these things. That way you didn't, like when you opened your box, like you had a manicure set to go. So the first couple of rounds, like I was like, okay, well, I need this. Okay. So I, I'm like, I'm a journal person. I write down like everything. So I'm like, okay, I need to start including this. Okay. You need to make an instruction list. You need to start making sample sizing kits. So it was like every set I was learning something new. And um, the first round, it went really well. And people were like, when are you going to drop more? I'm like, oh my goodness. And so like that led me to like creating my website. And I was like, okay, this is, this is it. Like, this is a thing now. And because of my type of nail art, it's very um, unique and different. Like my clients were always used to like paying more because I just know like my nail art isn't for everyone, but I did know like the people that liked my, my nail art were going to find me. So I kind of priced it according to that. And the press-ons are reusable. So you're going to get multiple uses out of them. So you kind of factor into that. But once I like gauged on a price point, I was like, okay, it might not be for everyone, but my tribe will find me, you know? Say that again. It might not be for everyone, but your tribe will find you. <laughs> yes. It's so true. You know, I think in the beginning, a lot of people are like in the beauty industry, they're like, you know, they're pricing their stuff comparative to other people and not necessarily based on their talent and their skills and their education and um, their skill set. So that is exclusive to you. You can't really worry about what she's doing over here. Like, what are you offering your clients that's different from other people? And that's what, I, you know, you got to take that into account. So in the beginning, you start selling and add this new angle to your business of having press-ons for sale with the thinking that you'll be able to open your studio again. But what happened as mm -hmm. the months went by? How did you uh, shift after that? I was like, you know, 
I had to start thinking long term, like everybody is turning their business to e-commerce, like it has to be online. And once I started to see the success of that, I was like, you know, this might be the way to go, like directing sales online. So that way, while you're not able to be in a studio, your work can still reach multiple people and you not you don't even have to be present with them to create this for them. So that kind of started to shift my mindset. Like you don't necessarily need a brick and mortar to produce. And mind you, it was just like a little corner out of my front room that I'm producing like these press songs at because I literally like had a studio, you know, it was insane, like moving all that back home. But it was just a point where I was like, you know, I have to like, even though I don't want to leave, like the way thing, you know, making lemonade out of lemons. So that's what I started to do. Was it easy to get rid of that studio as far as like financial commitments? At the same time, I'm sure it was a relief to have less overhead or was it a relief? Yes. So it's so insane because like I was doing both at the same time. So I was still selling press ons and still like paying for my studio. And that was intense because I was like, I can't do both. Like I literally was trying to do it all. And it was just like, it wasn't possible anymore. It was like stretching myself so thin and I wasn't going to be profitable because I was having so much overhead, like literally two entirely separate businesses. So once I let my studio go and I began to like, okay, you got to focus on this, focus on this thing in front of you. It started to mellow out and I'm like, okay, cool. Like it was all really trial and error. But once I let go of the studio, it was like a release in a sense, like, okay, you can focus on this now. And at least you don't have to pay for that overhead. So has it been something where you can see this new business model replicating and then exceeding your studio income stream? Or is it something where you're still hoping to one day get back in studio? So it's so complex because, you know, like you still as as a nail artist, you like the reason why you love it so much is your clientele, like that connection, the people like the actual thing, but there's benefits to like creating without having any like input from a client, I would say. And so like at first, like I told you I was doing both, so I couldn't really see any profit from it. But then as I like started to just focus and hone in on this, I started to notice like there is a lot of overhead with creating press on and a lot of time and effort, but it can be profitable. It can be profitable based on like what road you decide to go on. So for me, I'm like, these are exclusive sets. So for my mystery sets, no set is alike. So you can price that at a different type of price point because when those person, that person get those nails, you're not gonna see anyone else with those on. And so I was going and doing the mystery sets and then some of like certain looks, people were like, we really like these. So I started to make like go-to looks. And these were like press-ons that you could buy any time that were on my website but they weren't mystery sets, but you can just like buy that certain look. So I still had the mystery look and the go-to look. And I was like, wow, this is actually like becoming profitable. And so I was like, oh, wow. So I just kept on going. I'm like, as I was, every day was like a new learning experience. Mm -hmm. And it was just like so crazy because I'm like, I really used to see clients. (laughs) (laughs) Right. We really used to see human beings like way more regularly. We used to really see humans. So if there's one thing you had to change about your business from, you know, when you were booth renting to now that you're providing exclusive press-ons, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would change as you were starting up in your business just to make life easier for yourself and business easier for yourself? I think, see, I'm the type of person, I'm like, I think everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. Like, I think it happened to kind of teach me, like, you know, it taught me to let go and not to hold on to things that are no longer serving you, in a sense. We tend to hold on to things when we are scared of change. So I think I held on to my studio for a long time because I was scared of, like, what would I be without that studio? And I think like knowing, like believing in myself, like you're going to be fine. You're going to make lemonade. I think that would be like, let go and like, let go and let God. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I didn't know I was about to get a word. <laughs> <laughs> but you're oh, so, man. so right as far as it's been one of those things where like we literally have no other option but to adjust exactly. to change. So are we going to make it easy or hard on ourselves? Are we going to keep holding on and moving yes. or are we going to get moving on this new normal? Exactly. And I'm really proud and, and inspired by how you pivoted. I was like, oh, this is so amazing. This is a great Thank idea. You. And of course, I had to reach out to have you in the guest chair and inspire others as well. So I hope everyone listening, no matter what your business exactly. is, I hope the wheels start turning for even if the world, when the world opens up again, what online components you can have for your business. So now we're going to jump into the lightning round. You just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, what is a resource other than Google that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? I would definitely say Instagram. Like I, I know people have like uh, mixed feelings about social media, but I definitely felt like social media helped my business in so many ways and word of mouth. Those two things, like when your work speaks for itself, people are going to learn about it. People are going to share about it and they're going to authentically like tell their people like, oh, I like this. So I feel like word of mouth and letting Instagram and showing the behind the scenes like really helped. Number two. What is a non-negotiable part of your morning or daily routine? Tea time, journaling, um, meditation, prayer. Those things ground me and they help me like set the tension for my day. Number three, who is a Black woman entrepreneur who is a mentor in your head and who motivates you? I definitely would say like the owner of Pure Nova, their Black owned polish company and it's woman owned and just seeing her like you know build her nail polish brand out and her salon and just seeing how she did it from the beginning it, it's inspiring and amazing number four what is a personal trait you have that helps you significantly in your business planning like writing it down writing it out calendaring it <laughs> Those two things, like, they help so much. And then finally, number five, what is your parting advice for Black women side hustlers and entrepreneurs who are afraid to bet on themselves? Oh, man, that self-doubt will creep in. But you know what? Do it anyways. There are people who are less qualified doing what you want to do because they believed in their self. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it. Like step at a time and, you know, it's not going to all happen at once, but you got to show yourself grace and believe that you can do it. Like if you see there's a need or a want for it, why, like, why not? It can be you just, just slow steps, slow progression, write it down, write it down. Yes. And where can people connect with you after this episode? People can connect with me um, via social media, um, Nails by Kanishie, and also on my website, um, nailsbykanishie.com. Thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair and sharing your journey. And there you have it, you guys. Head over to sidehustlepro.co slash episodes for all of the show notes from this episode, including the links and resources that Kanishie mentioned. Thanks for joining and I will talk to you next week. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six foot Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.